Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for uh, sending Jesus. Thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit that, that we could uh, see that you've always been with us, that we could commune with you, that we could be refreshed by your presence. Thank you, Father, that uh, we are the place where you, you find your rest. And I just thank you, Lord, that, that we can be caught up into uh, intimacy with you, intimacy with your life, that uh, we can be caught up into union, that we, we could see that we've been made one, one flesh with you, really, through the body of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Um, communion, you know, you, you start to learn about communion. And really, communion, partaking of the body of Jesus. You notice when you get married, they, the people take communion as a sign of the two becoming one. And really what communion was meant to be about is you would partake of the body of Jesus. And that's you being reminded that you are one flesh with God through the body of Jesus Christ. And out of this, the two shall be made one. That would declare a powerful thing in your life. If you could just begin to contemplate, think about, whatever you want to call it, talk about it with friends, uh, read about it, write about it, whatever it might be, that you would get caught up in this union that you have with God. Because it's out of this union you have with the Father that flows every powerful thing, every bit of life, because the Father is the source of all life. And so we can talk about complicated things, we can say a lot of complicated things, but really it's a very simple thing right? We've been made one with God through the body of Jesus. And now we're just like growing in the, the understanding of what it means that we're one with God. I mean, what is it, how does it affect our lives today? How does it minister to us? It becomes a, it becomes a powerful ministration in the life, um, in our lives. So I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about that and, and look at Isaiah chapter 54 and and look at it from, from there. And everybody knows these passages already, but we'll just read them. Um, beginning with verse 1, Sing, O barren, thou that did not break, or thou that did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. Thou that did not travail with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations, Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more, for thy maker is thy husband the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. Now, listen, those verses aren't just written to women. And I know, guys, sometimes we can struggle to get caught up into this, oh, the bride of Christ. What do you mean I'm a bride? Right? I don't see myself wearing a dress. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And so there can be like this disconnect. But I, just encourage, I always encourage the men to understand it's symbolic, right? Yes, this is spoken to women also, but it's not um, about just a woman. And it's not really talking about a woman. It's not talking about a woman who wasn't able to have children. That's not the point of what's being said there. So it's not talking about a female that couldn't have any kids, and now she's going to be able to, to have any kids. So it's not about physical children. Okay, it's using that as imagery to express something else, right? So sing ye that were barren. And so in the context of this verse, you have a couple things. You have what it's saying to Israel right then, and then you would have what it would be saying to mankind or human beings. And so in the context of Israel, Israel was supposed to be priests to the world, and they were supposed to declare God to the world. And through declaring God to the world, they would be fruitful, meaning they would have the Gentiles come in to the kingdom of God. They also would dwell in the promised land where the, the land is flowing with milk and honey, right? And they would be exceedingly fruitful in the promised land. But they went a whoring after other gods. They fornicated with their own strength. They looked to their own hand and they worshiped their own ability to produce life. So they became married to another God, which is no God at all. 
And the God they became married to or joined themselves to is death. That's why he talks about the reproach of your widowhood. Who's a widow? The reason you're a widow is because you're married to someone who's dead. You're married to someone who died. And so they had joined themselves to death itself. And because they were joined to get death, guess what wasn't being produced in them? Fruit. The fruit of God's life was not coming forth in them because death cannot produce fruit. And in fact, what death will do is leave you barren. Death will leave you like an arid, dry ground, like a desert waste place, like a dust bowl, right? You ever seen that Charlie Brown commercial where you had the one character that's real dirty and the dust is just walking with him everywhere he goes? He's got dirt everywhere. I can't remember what his name was. Pigpen, okay. Pigpen. And then there was like a, a Smurf. I can't remember what the Smurf was called, but there was also a, a, a dirty Smurf that was always like a dust bowl, like sloppy Smurf or something like that, right? And so Israel was that way. And Israel is actually a picture of mankind, right? We, we lose sight of that because we only think of it after Israel after the flesh. And we, we miss that it's a shadow pointing to the substance. So that's what it's talking about with Israel. They perished from off the land. And the reason why they did is because they went a whoring after other gods, which meant they were intimate with their own strength. They tried to produce the fruit of God's life. They wanted to bear fruit or be very fruitful by looking to their own strength. Well, guess what you don't have in your own strength? The ability to produce life. We're the branch. We're not the vine. And so if you're not going to abide in the vine, how are you going to bear much fruit? You can't. So then you find the branch withering up and dying. So that's what was happening with Israel. But on a larger scale, that was just a sign of mankind. We were also barren, right? In Adam, we were barren. We were not bearing the fruit of God's life. We had become married to death. We become married to the body of death. Adam built the body when he brought sin into the earth, and the body he built is perishable. And it was all the time bearing the fruit of death. We were the reproach of our widowhood. We were married to death, and it was leaving us ashamed because we knew we were supposed to be fruitful. We knew we were supposed to be bearing the fruit of God's life, but then we didn't see it anywhere. And not only did we not see it anywhere, we started making judgments about what it meant that we didn't see it. And do you know what we thought it meant? That God had forsaken us, that He abandoned us, that He left us alone, that He didn't want anything do to do with us. Right? Like a man might come and look at his wife and he doesn't find she's fruitful, so he's going to leave her to go get with another wife. And so we began living with God as if that was the case. And so not only were we barren, but we were ashamed of our barrenness. And it was a reproach to us. And we were confounded because we started thinking, where's our God? Right? Where is he? Doesn't he love us? Doesn't he want us? And, and so you have that going on in the context here with Isaiah prophesying about this. Okay, so barren. I mean, when we think of barren, we think of a desert, right? A, a dry wasteland. An arid, dry wasteland is what the scriptures would talk about. A dust bowl, a place where the, the ground is so dry, it's brittle, right? The, the nutrients have been stripped from it, in fact. And so it's not saturated with any moisture. In fact, it's been so long since it's seen any moisture, it's just become dry and cracked and wasting away. You're looking around, you can't even see a cactus anywhere. That's what barren would talk about. That's what it would point to. And so when you think of barrenness, that's what you want to think about. And if you want like a human example, you can look at Abraham and Sarah. They would have been barren, and not just barren in the sense of not having children, but they were dead in their flesh, and Sarah was dead in their womb. When Paul talked about Abraham, he says Abraham didn't consider the deadness in his body or the deadness in Sarah's womb, but he considered God. He glorified God. He saw God had a life in himself that can even overcome the deadness of his flesh, and he saw God could even make him fruitful even though he was clothed in a body of death. And so that's the kind of barrenness we're talking about, where God is desiring to make us fruitful. We actually all know we're supposed to be fruitful, and ain't nobody got to tell us. Like I've been talking about a lot the last several months, when we were made in the image of God, it put everlasting in our hearts. 
What it meant was we had an inherent knowing that we were meant for life and we were meant to be clothed in life. We were meant to see the fruit of God's life coming out of us. So if we find ourselves in the place where we don't think we see the fruit of life, it bothers us. It tries to have a voice to us. It tries to tell us that we've been forsaken, right? In Isaiah, even if you go on, it says, like a wife forsaken in her youth, right? And, and Isaiah goes on to quote God and say, um, I let you loose for a little while. In a little wrath, I hid my face from you. But with everlasting kindness, I've gathered you to myself. Do you see what the key part of that phrase is? Everlasting. Do you know what everlasting means? With perpetuity, without beginning, and without end. So God's saying, my face was hidden from you for a little while, and you, for, you took it as if I was forsaking you. But I was never actually forsaking you. That's not why my face was hid. In fact, it was part of my everlasting kindness, my everlasting longing to be joined together with you. And so then you might say, well then, what's his face being hidden for? What's going on there? What's that all about? Well, I'll tell you what it's all about, is we had joined ourselves to a different husband. And the husband we joined ourselves to was bringing forth death in us, and it was killing us. And he, so he saw our union to death, and he couldn't bless our union to death. He could never feel good about it. It's like a father. Those of you that are fathers, imagine your daughter brings a serial killer home and tells you, well, they've repented. But you know this guy has killed hundreds of people. I mean, death is the greatest serial killer there ever was, isn't it? Yeah. How many people has death taken? So now imagine your daughter comes to the house and brings death and tells you about her love and her desire to be joined to death. Can you ever bless that union? And even in the ancient world, if you rejected something, you turned your, ba you turned your back on it. And a father, I mean, when I was going to marry Becky, I called her dad. Do you know what I asked for? His blessing. I wanted his blessing for the union. And I'm thankful he gave it to me. He didn't turn his face. He didn't hide his face from our union. But when it talks about God's face being hidden, it's like a father that could never approve of his daughter's marriage to a guy. And because he couldn't approve of the union, and why wouldn't he approve of the union? He might think the guy is going to abuse his daughter. The guy is going to bring forth death in his daughter's life. And he can't conceive of that, and he could never allow it to be, right? And so that's the, the likeness of we find God hiding his face, because for his face to shine upon something is for him to bless it. Do you think he can bless our union to death? How can he? If he made us for life, and he made us to be one with him, so that we could bear much fruit, so that he could see the glory of his life pouring out of us. If he made us for that, and now we're married to death, and so we become a barren, dry wasteland, and we're not bearing fruit unto life, we're bearing fruit unto death, how could he bless that union? And so we've confused God rejecting our union to death with God rejecting us. You see? And just like a daughter that brings a guy home and wants her father's approval, but the father is like, I can't approve of that. And so he won't do it. Do you know, I've seen situations like that. I've counseled people like that. Do you know many times the daughter goes away and she doesn't see it as the father loving her? Because isn't that why the father would reject the union? Because he loves her and he wants her to be fruitful. Her life is precious and he sees that this union's going to destroy her. So he's doing it out of love. And he's not actually rejecting the daughter. He's rejecting the union. But many times the daughter can become very upset and think the father is rejecting her. But he's not. It's actually part of his everlasting kindness, right? To get her away from that union. And so God hid his face from our union to death because he could never be happy with that. He could never be happy with us fornicating with death because it was leaving us barren. And he saw that the barrenness the inability to bear the fruit of his life was destroying us and leaving us full of shame and confounded, confused. He saw that. So his face was hidden for a little while to show his rejection to the way that we thought was unto life. That's what it was hid from. And you even see a picture of this in the law. In the law, it says there was a veil. 
in between God and the people. And so it demonstrated a distance. And, and so you would say God's face was hidden behind the veil. And you couldn't see God's face. Right? Well, it wasn't a sign of God not wanting to be with people. It wasn't a sign of God rejecting people. But we were trying to have life by the strength of our own hands. There was a way that we thought was the way unto life. But it wasn't the way unto life. It was killing us. And so God in the law had his face hidden because he was trying to tell us the way that you've implemented in your life can never bring you into my presence. It can never strengthen you to stand face to face with me and cause you to experience my love. It will all the time cause you to be filled with fear and shame in my presence. And it will actually work death in you. So my face is hidden for a little while. The, the, Paul even comes and says in Romans that the law worketh wrath. It doesn't mean the law worketh anger. The wrath of God is not the wrath of a man. The word wrath means for God to reject something. And you know what God rejected? Our union to death. He rejected our fornication with other gods. He rejected our adultery. Not because he was angry with us, but because it was killing us. And he knew that he was the only one that could actually produce fruit in us. I'm the only one that can be joined together with them and produce fruit in them. I'm the only one that can decorate them in the fruit of life. And so I'm rejecting this way that they've chosen. I'm rejecting their union to their own works. I'm rejecting their union to death. And so the law revealed God's rejection of us looking to our own strength. That's why Paul would come and say that the law revealed what sin was. Sin isn't talking about bad behavior. Sin is to think you can exalt yourself unto life by your own strength. Adam tried to clothe himself with life. And so the law revealed God's rejection of that way because it joined us to death and it was leaving us barren. Rejected it. Right? You guys following that so far? Does that make sense? I know we brought out some heavy concepts and we all have definitions of wrath and stuff. And that's why it can be difficult. Because I talk about the dictionary of our hearts. We have a dictionary in our hearts already. And what that means is, is we all have an idea of what these words mean. Like, once, the second I said the word wrath, every single one of you had a picture. And probably some of us had different pictures because of what we've wrestled with already or what we've talked about or whatever. But you want to understand that about yourself, that we already have a preconceived notion of words. You saw how I just ripped up our preconceived notion of what wrath meant? And it's actually a form of God's kindness. It's actually him rejecting our union to death and rejecting that which joined us to death. Well, why would you do that? Because you love them and you actually want to be joined together with them. You made them so you could be one flesh with them and they could be one flesh with you. You made them because you desired to dwell in their house for all eternity. You desired to be in them and you wanted them to be in you. And out of that would come forth much fruit. That's why you would reject that way. It's a function of the love of God, right? So thy maker is thy husband, he says. Sing you that were barren, your maker is your husband. Well, in the ancient world, the man, when he wanted to be married to a woman, I mean, they come and give a proposal, right? They come with a proposal. I, I know it's gotten lost in the modern world in some circles, what it actually means to propose to people. But do you know in the ancient world, a proposal, when a proposal happened, the man would look at his life and he would think, my life is so beautiful, I want to pour it out for the benefit of someone else. And he would look for someone whose life he thought was so precious that he wanted to empty himself for them that he would spend all his days loving them with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength. He's looking for someone that he can lay down his life so they can be exalted. In fact, he would want to decorate the woman with his life. He would think her life is so precious. I have something in myself. I can pour it out. And in pouring myself out for them, they can be exalted. They can be beautified. They can be decorated. And you see this image in Ezekiel where God says, I walked by them when they were in their blood, and behold, it was the time of love. And I walked by them, and I said, live, live. And then he came and decorated. I spread my skirt over them, and I decorated them. That's all marriage language. The skirt would be the chupa that you could see in a Jewish wedding, where they have that canopy over them. And it's a picture of the man spreading his life over the woman for the purpose of exalting her or beautifying her or decorating her in himself, really. 
And so if a man saw a woman that was like, wow, like the first time I saw Becky, you guys hear me say this all the time, and not that Becky, although Becky, you're a lovely woman. <laughs> Becky, my wife, the first time I saw Becky, my wife, when she walked down the stairs, it was like she was in slow motion, right? And you know, in Hollywood, when you see the hair blowing in the wind, like, but there's a fan there. Well, there was no fan, and it was like her hair was blowing in the wind. And it was like, all I could hear was, who's that lady? Who's that lady? And I'm just like, wow. And I, I wasn't thinking of what can this woman do for me? I promise you that thought never came into my mind. I, I was thinking of, I want to lay down my life for this woman. And that's how it was in the old world. If you saw something that was so precious to you that you wanted to empty yourself for them, you wanted to pour yourself out for their life. You wanted to offer them your life. In fact, when you proposed, what you were vowing to them is your own life. You were dedicating your life to them. I promise you, I will empty myself for your well-being. That, that was the proposal. That's what was going on at the time of a proposal. That's what a man would say. Now, the woman would be confronted with, you know, the proposal. And one of the first things they would think about is, what kind of life does this dude have? <laughs> we still got that part of it today. But, you know, I, and back to before I get into that, I tell the young guys today, because the young guys today that I counsel, they don't understand that. I'm like, do you understand what you've done when you propose? Because the world has gotten so full of selfishness, not because we're bad people, but because we haven't really been taught about the abundant life of God. And if you don't know about the abundance in God's life, you're busy like trying to hoard life to yourself. And you become consumed with caring for your own life. And then when you think of marriage, what you think about is how can the woman benefit me, right? Which is a completely corrupt thing. And so I tell the, man, the, the young man, I'm like, listen, you're dedicating your life to her. You're actually telling her you want to lay down your life for her. You're not thinking of what you can get from her. And don't misunderstand me. I tell him it's not that you won't get something for her, from her. I said, because I tell you what, if a woman actually believes that you've emptied yourself for her, that you've poured yourself out for her, that you've laid down your life for her, she will blossom and flourish and she will become an ornament to you. There is nothing that woman won't do for you if she feels cherished like that. But the beginning of the proposal is the promise of your own life, the dedication of your life, an offering. We talk about an offering and how the Lord offered his own body. Well, we'll get to it, but that's part of the proposal, right? And so that's really what you're offering when you ask a woman to marry you. You're offering her yourself, my life, right? That's where it would go. That's what you're thinking of. Does that make sense? And so now it would hit the woman. And you know what the woman's left to do? Like I said, what kind of life does this dude have? And not just what kind of life does this dude have, but what kind of life do I need? And does the life that they're offering me or promising me, can it actually satisfy my needs? The, the need I have for life, can it actually meet those needs? Can it actually bring it forth? And see, and all this comes together with God and mankind, right? Because when you think about this proposal, when you think about getting down on bended knee, because that's what we do, right? We get down on bended knee. Maybe not so much anymore, but that was their tradition, right? I mean, we're the image of God. So much of what we do comes from the fact that we were made in the image of God, and we don't even realize it. Do you know why we even get down on one knee? Because Genesis says God got down on one knee when he barocked Adam. When he blessed Adam, it means he got down on one knee in adoration. It's called bended knee in Genesis. He got down on bended knee and he proposed to Adam. And what he promised Adam was himself. And he promised Adam that he would make Adam exceedingly fruitful. I know we only read it there in the context of Adam needing to create children and replenish the earth. And yes, there's a natural application there. We're not getting rid of the natural application. But if you look at Abraham, Abraham brings out a big part of what God said to Adam because did God tell Abraham to be exceedingly fruitful or did he promise Abraham he would make him exceedingly fruitful? Right. And so that's giving us eyes to look into what's there. It's actually there in the Hebrew if you look at it. 
If you crack it open in the ancient Hebrew, you can see one of the meanings would be to promise someone to decorate them. And so God was promising Adam himself. He was dedicating to Adam his life towards the end of Adam being decorated. That's what he was doing. Right? And so Abraham, he was dead in the flesh. So you notice what Abraham said at first? I know we say Abraham believed and he was righteous and all those things are true. But you can crack that thing open and start to see so much there. What did Abraham say at first? What shall you give me, Lord, seeing I have no heir? So God comes and makes a promise to Abraham and Abraham's like, bro, have you seen me? Have you seen my wife? And so originally... Abraham would be like the woman proposed to, even though he's not a woman. Remember, it's symbolic, okay? Don't lose me if you're a man. It's symbolic, okay? It's being made one flesh. It's talking about union with God. The Father was in Jesus, and Jesus was in the Father. That's actually marriage language. It has, it's not sexual, okay? It's not about the man going to now wear a dress and be a woman, okay? That's not what we're talking about when we talk about that. But God proposed something to Adam, He proposed, or not to Adam, to Abraham, that he would make him exceedingly fruitful. But immediately, what does Abraham look at? The deadness he sees. How are you going to get that right? How are you going to sort that out? Right? And so Abraham is is like, how is this going to work? And, and, And God, I am your exceeding great reward. I am your shield and your buckler. But Abraham's still not understanding it. So what does Abraham do in his ignorance? He goes and lays with Hagar and he tries to make himself fruitful through the strength of his flesh, because he can't comprehend how's this going to work. Well, then God waits 18 years, like we said today. He lets Abraham's seed dry up, and then he shows back up. Now Abraham's dead. Sarah's dead. Abraham's dead. Okay, we're going to help this dude with tunnel vision. God had mercy on Abraham. Abraham came from idol worshipers. Get you out of Ur of the Chaldees. It was a land of idol worship. God had mercy on him. He doesn't understand. So that's when God shows up and says, I am the almighty God. That's El Shaddai, right? Walk before me and I shall perfect you. What he's saying is, look to me in my strength because inside of me is a life that even overcomes death in the flesh. Do you know what you need to be exceedingly fruitful? You need a life that can even overcome death. Well, guess what kind of life I'm offering to you? Guess what kind of life I'm proposing to you? I'm proposing to you an indestructible life, the kind of life that isn't at the mercy of death, the kind of life that can even eradicate death from the flesh. Walk before me and you will find yourself decorated in the fruit of life. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And then Abraham, ah, I see. So we get the cross and the resurrection. I've been saying this a lot because I think in our theology we believe it, but then we don't realize. I realize in my own life I had conflicting beliefs and I didn't know it. And we have ideas that are opposed to each other and most of us don't recognize it. Something the Lord's done in me has helped me see the contradictions that I have and then draw me up into Him. But most every Christian I know would say Jesus is God. But then we get to the cross and all of a sudden He's not God somehow. And, and, and we strip the union and relationship, because God's a relational being. He's Trinitarian, Father, Son, and Spirit. It's always been relational, and he's trying to catch us up into this intimacy, into this union, into this relationship. And so we only look at the cross. Is God dealing with our bad behavior? We've been bad boys and girls, and now he's going to spank someone. But he's actually God coming in the likeness of Isaiah, seeing us, the one he wants to be married to, the one he wants to be betrothed to, and he sees that we're joined to death. And he sees that we're bearing fruit unto death and we're full of shame and we're confounded. We don't think he's with us. We don't think he wants us anymore. Because after all, it looks like his face is hidden, right? We talked about that. And we don't see that he's rejecting our union. So the cross is God once again getting down on bended knee. And what he's, do- what he's doing is he's proposing to the world all over again. And do you know what he's saying? I'm dedicating my life to you. I'm promising you my life. I vow that I will empty myself for you. I will lay down my life so your life can be exalted. I ever live to pour myself out for you so you can be served with life. To the degree that he even sheds his blood. I mean, my man's serious as a heart attack about dedicating his life towards our well-being. And he's showing us how serious he is by even shedding his blood. 
And we talk in Hebrews about the covenant and how the covenant seals a testament. Well, marriage is a covenant. And we've made covenant like contract. We've ripped the relationship out of it. We've ripped the intimacy out of it. And we made it more like a mortgage. But the blood of the new covenant is God swearing by himself. Swearing, I swear to you, that I will provide myself a lamb to the end that you can be divorced from death and you can be free to be married to me. And if you want to know about how serious I am towards serving you with life all my days, I'm even here shedding my blood. That's his proposal. I'll empty my life for you. And now, but but again, we talked about we're a certain kind of a, a bride. We're dead. We're dying. So if someone's going to come and promise us their life, we need a certain kind of life. We have certain kinds of needs. And do you know the kind of life we need? We need the kind of life that can overcome death in the flesh. We need the kind of life that should have come alive inside of us. It can even purge our body from death. And it can give us a body that can never die again. Because that's what we need. And so the cross is the proposal. I will lay down my life for you. But then we need to examine the life that he has to offer us. Okay, what kind of life you got to offer us? Because I don't know, that cross looks kind of ugly to my carnal mind. That looks like a mangled kind of a thing. Yes, 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 I understand that it looks like that. So now here comes the resurrection, which would actually be the substance of God saying, I am the almighty God. The resurrection is God once again coming and saying, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and I will perfect you. Perfect you from what? Deadness in the flesh. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will decorate you in the fruit of my life. You'll first have the first fruits with the peace and love and joy and kindness and rest and fear being sent away from you and your flesh being put to rest and all the fruit that death tried to bring forth in your life, it will fall off of you. That will be the first fruit of me perfecting you from death. But what I'm actually going to then do is I'm going to cleanse your whole body from death and I'm going to build you a body that has no death in it and you're going to dwell forever in glorified flesh with me. So now we see this life that he's offering us in the resurrection and the glorification of Jesus. And we're like, well, that sure speaketh. Okay, that, now we're talking. Yeah. This suitor has got something now. <laughs> right? This suitor is starting to, he's, he's, he's getting close to, to what we need. And so we're looking at it. We're getting caught. That's the captivation. He draws us to start considering this life. Isn't this what you need? It actually isn't this what you've been wanting all along. I made you in my image to be the bearer of my likeness. You're like E.T. in E.T. phone home. You have everlasting in your heart. You're actually seeking this life right here. It's just you didn't know where it was. And now I hear I am showing it to you. Isn't this the life you need? And we see the resurrection and we're like, yes. We need the kind of life that can superabound over death. We need the kind of life that isn't at the mercy of death, that even should all the death in the world try to come upon us and destroy us. We need the kind of life that can even cause us to overcome that. And so we're needing someone to propose to us, someone to be joined together with, someone we can be caught up in a marriage with, a union with, that has that kind of a life. Well, now we see real clearly, God's got that kind of a life. Are you guys with me? Does that make any sense? (laughs) Recently, I've been talking about the doctrine of God. And um, I've said it probably three times already, this message. I've found that we've stripped the relational aspect out of God. So many things become transactional or just kind of like stoic, contractual. God's doctrine is no different. And it's not that we can't understand things with our intellect or that our intellects are bad. Please don't misunderstand me, right? I'm not against uh, intellectual thinking and contemplating. I'm not against that. But we've stripped the relational aspect out of doctrine. And doctrines just become about I'm right and you're wrong. We don't even stop and think about why it matters what we believe. We just believe it. And if you don't believe it, we're going to argue now. Right? But God's, God has his own doctrine. And we'll just read these verses real quick. This is Deuteronomy 32.1. It's called the Song of Moses. And it's Moses speaking, but he's speaking on behalf of God. 
Because if you're a prophet, you're not speaking your own words. You're speaking the words of somebody else. That's why you would call a prophet. So Moses was a prophet for God. He comes speaking for God. And listen to what Moses says. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. You notice how that's water? What were we? Barren, a dry wasteland. All right, you're making the connection there. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish my name. I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. You know, when you look at that word for doctrine there in the Hebrew in Deuteronomy, do you know what it talks about? Getting caught up into a marriage. God ain't busy trying to argue about who's right and who's wrong. God's busy. His doctrine is making a proposal. His doctrine is offering you himself and then cracking that open for you. And the whole point that he comes and unveils himself is so that you could be caught up into a union with him, right? And we get into so many arguments about doctrines and we haven't even first thought about how does this help someone experience God? How does this catch someone up in a union with God before we busy arguing? And listen, I'm, I've been guilty of that. I mean, I'm like 48 now, but when I was like 30-something years old, right, I'm just like, Bleh, you know? And I'm, I'm out arguing with people about all this stuff. And listen, most of the time, if we want to just allow the poverty of my language, most of the time I was actually right. But I didn't even know why I was arguing. And I could have won more people to the truth if I could have presented why it matters. But we ought to first think about why it matters what we're arguing for. And we ought to weigh, how does this help somebody get caught up in the union with God? How does this help somebody experience the love of God? How does this help somebody be clothed in the fruit of God's life? Because that's what God's doctrine's about. It's about coming and removing whatever's keeping somebody from him and catching them up into his body, which is the body of Christ. Why? So they could be one flesh with him and he could do what? Bear much fruit in them, right? Overcome death in their flesh. I remember I was arguing with somebody about spirit, soul, and body, or it was about to turn into an argument. And I guess I was like 36 maybe. And I was about to just start technically tearing down his doctrine. And please don't misunderstand me, anybody. I believe that humans have a spirit, a soul, and a body. I just believe there's a, a clearer way of explaining why that matters than what we've maybe been presented with. I'm not against anybody. I'm just saying. And so he was talking about this, and I was about to jump into my normal technical, you know, breakdown. And I just heard God say, don't do that. Ask him how knowing that blesses him. And so I just stopped and I asked the guy and I said, how does knowing that bless your life? And do you know what? He couldn't answer. He didn't even know how it blessed his life. And then he realized, what the heck am I believing it for then? And so I could have spent hours arguing with him. He probably would have gotten upset trying to defend his doctrine. And I eliminated all that just by asking him, how does that bless you? And when he realized he couldn't give an answer, he realized he was just after getting his ducks in a row. And it's really easy for us to get caught up in getting our ducks in a row. And I'm probably the chief of that kind of a sinner. And I don't say that as if God is upset with me. I'm long since past thinking God's upset with me if he finds me in some error, right? A father does not get upset with their child when they find him in an error. They come to reason with them because they love them. They see themselves in the face of the child, and the child is so precious to them, they're not thinking about the error. Rather, they're thinking about child training or growing them up into themselves, right? And so when we think about doctrine, we need to be thinking about humans being caught up into union with God because that's what God's doctrine does. And so like we just said, what would cause us to be caught up into a union with God? What would cause us to look to him, to accept the proposal? Well, notice what he says about his doctrine, because his doctrine is his proposal. And like we just said, Jesus is God's doctrine. The word was made flesh. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh. That's God's doctrine. 
Jesus is God's doctrine. The whole gospel of John is Jesus walking around as God in the flesh, Emmanuel, showing us who and what God is and the life God has in himself. For what purpose? Drawing us to himself, catching us up into a union with himself. He even talks in John 17 about glorify me that it might glorify you. We have life in ourselves. I'm about to go to the cross and pour my life out for them so that we can make a proposal to them of the life we want to lay down so they can have life. Glorify me so they can see the life we have in ourselves to offer can even overcome death because that's the kind of proposal they need. And Jesus goes on to say that as we are one, and you're in me and I'm in you, that they might be perfect in us, that they might be sanctified in joining in with us in that union. That's marriage. And so Jesus comes as a living, moving, breathing human, but he's God's doctrine, he's God's proposal. And notice what Moses says about the proposal. Because remember, we're a barren, dry wasteland. We talked about being barren, the imagery there. We're a dust bowl. The ground's cracked. You can't even find a tender herb growing up anywhere. That's how dry it is. There's no oasis anywhere. There's just desert. There's been no crop for generations. And notice what he says about the doctrine. Because it would, it, it would really, whenever it doesn't rain, last year in Slidell we had a drought. And even all the grass turned brown. Do you know what we were longing for every day? Rain. And, you know, normally you get a lot of dew in Slidell. So let the, let the dew come up from the ground. And so that's how we were. We were like a drought. And so there we are. God comes and says, my doctrine will drop as the rain. <laughs> we were aground with the nutrient stripped. He says, my doctrine will drop as the rain. My proposal to you is filled with the nutrients of life. My speech will distill as the dew. My proposal of my life and the demonstration of what kind of life I'm proposing to you, it will saturate you. It will be as a river of living water pouring out of me onto you, healing your dryness, healing your barrenness, and making you exceedingly fruitful. And that, that, that's why you would sing if you were barren. And if you had deadness in your body, and you saw deadness in your flesh, see, what we don't understand as human beings, Abraham thought dead. death was the Almighty God. Why do you think he come and said, what shall you give me, Lord? And so that's how mankind was. What shall you give me, Lord? We're barren, and this is just where we are. That's all that there is. And his doctrine drops as the dew. It saturates our dry bones. Son of man, can these bones live? Thou knowest, Lord, prophesy. The prophesying is live, live. Ezekiel says, I walked by them in their blood, and I, it was the time of love. I wanted to be joined together with them, even though they were barren and in death. And so I said, live, live, prophesy. Prophesy is propose. It's a proposal. It's God's doctrine. Live, live. My doctrine will abound in all the waste places, making the land, we're the land, a land that flows with milk and honey. I will be your provision for life. I will pour myself out for your well-being. My life will abound over your waste places. It will bring forth vineyards you haven't planted. It will make you a house you didn't build, a house, a heavenly house, glorified immortal flesh. My goodness. That eliminates all the other suitors. Yes. Now all of a sudden, the things you were fornicating with, wanting to be fruitful, thinking that that's what could make you fruitful, because that's what the world does, isn't it? Isn't that what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil did? It looked good for food. It looked like it could make one fruitful. <laughs> and so now that eliminates all the, the suitors. I mean, we were made from the dust of the ground, it says. Our bodies were but dust, but we were never made to remain but dust. 
we are always intended to be joined together in a union with God Himself, Father, Son, and Spirit, that we would transcend merely an earthy state or a dust state, and we would transcend into a heavenly state. We were always intended for heaven and earth to collide in us. And then that's how we would be exceedingly fruitful. That's the saturation. That's the river of living water. That's God pouring out of himself his life to the end that our dryness, our barrenness, our wasteland could be saturated with the nutrients of life and we could be like a tree unceasing in its fruitfulness. Like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Do you know one of the, 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 the most difficult things most humans have to deal with when they walk in the earth? Do you know what the earth is always telling us? That we're barren. It is. I mean, the, the world is all the time trying to point at your life and where's the fruit? You know, like that Wendy, where's the beef? If you really are. If God really does. How is this happening? And this is meant to keep us from that. So if you feel like there's some barrenness in your life, there's nothing wrong with you. It doesn't mean that your Lord, your Father, has abandoned you. It doesn't mean that. He's joined Himself to you. That's what the verse is saying. Your Maker is your husband. If you've been joined to God, if you become one flesh with God himself, with Father, Son, and Spirit, the life he has in himself overcomes barrenness. And it's a guarantee. And so you want to start having the mind that Abraham had where he didn't consider the deadness he saw. He didn't consider the barrenness because he was joined with God. I'm one flesh with God. Therefore, this death can't not keep me from bearing much fruit because the life that's in my husband, who is my maker, even overcomes death in the flesh. It says you're unceasing in your fruitfulness even when the sun scorches you. And so you can be scorched by the sun in a moment. But you're planted in something that can bear fruit even in the midst of a scorching sun. And we even see a picture of that in the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross because he looks like a barren wasteland on the cross, doesn't he? Doesn't he look like life is as far from him as it could ever be? And yet out of the midst of him looking like he's a barren wasteland, like he has nothing in himself, no life, do you know what comes pouring out of him? Love. Isn't love the fruit of life? Yes. And it wasn't just any kind of love. He didn't love the people who were being good to him or being nice to him. He loved his enemies. He was busy loving the people, nailing them to a tree. So he had a life that was even super abounding over the wasteland, the scorching of the heat. He was unceasing in his fruitfulness, even when it looked like he had all death. Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it falls into the ground and dies, it does what? Bears much fruit. So yeah, he was put to death in the flesh, just like a seed. You know, a seed, it's the outer shell that dies. The inside of the shell doesn't die. That's the life. That's the nutrients. It falls into the ground. The outer shell falls away. And then the nutrients inside the seed that's full of life sprouts up new life. Well, Jesus is eternal life. But he put on a body that could taste death for us. So now Peter says he was put to death in the flesh. So he was put to death in his body, but inside that body was a life that can't die. And then that life got sowed into the earth. And we see the kind of life our maker has. It has a life that can even superabound over death in the flesh. So even when people come to destroy me, my maker, my husband, the one I'm one with, the one I have communion with, the one I have intimacy with, the one I've been caught up into this union with, I'm one flesh with him. He's got a life that even produces the fruit of the Spirit in the midst of all the wasteland. His life will produce an oasis in me in the middle of a wasteland. It says Jesus was like a tender herb growing up in a dry ground. And so now we see the kind of life that we're joined to in God. And we don't just rejoice over the first fruit. We know that that life will even glorify our bodies with immortality. It does a perfect work. It don't just come to comfort you and give you peace and love and joy and patience and long-suffering while you're here. No, but it does something where it 
puts off this body of death and it clothes upon with a body that can never die, that can't feel weakness, that can never be stung by death again. Paul said Jesus died unto sin once, never to die again. He was raised in a body that can't be touched by death. That's the life our maker has in himself. If we have been proposed to, if we have have God getting down on bended knee to us, we want to think of what is it he's promised us and what is it we've become one with. And we want to begin to think that that's the life we've been made partakers of. Because you ladies that have been married, when you think about your life, are you thinking about the dude you're not married to down the road? No, you're thinking about the one you're married to in your house with him. That's how you think of your life. Well, your maker is your husband. When we think about our life, we ought not be thinking about what we see in the world. We ought to be thinking about what we see in the house of God, in the glorified man Jesus, seated next to the Father at his right hand. That's what we ought to be thinking about. That's what we ought to be considering. So even if it looks like we're barren, we would still be singing because we know our maker is our husband and we know the kind of life that he has. It even made Abraham exceedingly fruitful. It raised Jesus up from the dead. What? That's why you would sing if you were barren. You wouldn't consider the barrenness. You would consider the life of the one who proposed to you. And he's so serious about you having life, he shed his blood. There's no end that he won't go through to love you with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength. You know, we read the scriptures, you shall love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then we immediately think that's what we do to him. And then we define it in a corrupt way. We define it as what we're going to do for him. But John comes and says, herein is love. Not that you love God, but that God loves you. And so loving God with all your heart, with all your strength, isn't talking about something you do for him. It's you being persuaded that he loves you. It's you being persuaded he wants to spend all his days emptying himself for you. It's you being persuaded that he gave you eternal life so that he could spend all his days loving you with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength. When you ask somebody to marry you, you're wanting to be married your whole life. You're not wanting to be married for 10 years. God's living a long time. And so he wants someone that he can spend all his days emptying himself for. And so he needs to preserve their lives eternally. That's us. And so part of the marriage proposal is that you're telling the woman that you will carry the weight of producing life in them. I will provide the life. And you just live and move and have your being in the life. Because actually what blesses the husband is for the wife to flourish in the house that's been provided. And as she flourishes, she becomes an ornament. I say this all the time to men and women when I counsel them. Men don't receive love the same way women do. Men receive love more like respect. Like my wife does a lot of nice things for me, and I like it. I like what she does. It's not that I don't like it, right? It's not that it means nothing. But do you know how I feel loved? When I see that she's persuaded that I love her. And when she's able to flourish, that's when I feel loved. That's how it is with God. He's not looking for you to do something for him. He's looking for you to be persuaded that he loves you. He's looking for you to let him make you flourish. Because then you become an ornament, right? And you actually start testifying of the glory of God, (laughs) right? Your life becomes a testimony of the God that can preserve from death. And that's what it means to be the salt and the light. Salt's a preservative. Do you know what it preserves from? decay. You know how you're the salt of the earth? Your life declares the God that can preserve even from death. And you know how you become a light? When people see that you're not living in the fear of death, and you, they see that you have something in you, you begin declaring the one that can preserve from death. That's how you glorify God. You point to God who has a life that conquers death. You drop God's doctrine. You declare Jesus. You declare his proposal, right? So that the other people who are barren can see that they're not a wife forsaken, that they're not as a woman that's been abandoned, that God doesn't despise them for their nakedness. He doesn't despise them for their barrenness. He's come to make them fruitful. He's come to lay down his life so theirs can be exalted. That's God's doctrine. 
And we could say a lot of things about intricacies. We can get into faith without works is dead. I mean, we can get into all those things. We could talk about walking in the Spirit, walking after the flesh. We could talk about being in Adam, being in Christ. We can say a lot of things about all of that. And all those things have their place. But we want to see how do they connect back to God catching somebody up into a union? And how do those things, if they're not presented correctly, keep somebody from experiencing union? Right? Because that's the doctrine of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's meant to speak to the barren. How does it speak to the barren? Because it declares a life that overcomes barrenness. And it declares a suitor that is willing to empty themselves for the well-being of the one that's barren. Okay, now that's good news. No, he needs nothing from us and wants to give us everything. Otherwise, he can't be God. I don't, we don't even stop and realize what it means to be God. To be God means you don't need anything. You have everything. You're self-existent. That's what Yahweh is, the self-existent one. I am. That means I'm self-existent. I don't need anything. But I want you. And I don't want you so you can do something for me. I want you so I can empty myself into you. So I can pour myself out for you. That's why I want you. Just like I said, I wasn't thinking of what Becky could do for me. When she come walking down those stairs, and I was like, who's that lady? I wasn't thinking, well, I wonder if she can cook. I wonder if she can make meals. I wonder if she can handle my gregariousness. That's not what I was thinking. I was thinking, I wonder if she'll let me lay down my life for her. I wonder if she'll let me spend all my days loving her. That's what I was thinking. And that's how it is with God, right? That's why the barons sing. That's why there's something to sing for. And God doesn't, we get everything so backwards with God. He doesn't command us to sing. Well, you should sing. No. He shows you something that brings forth song. Right? That's what he does. Does that make any sense? Do you guys see that? Yeah, especially on dry ground. Yes, yes. Yeah. Even the trees perched up when it started to rain again. We have fruit trees. We have a satsuma tree. We have a, a Meyer lemon tree. We have these blueberry bushes, and they were like sad. And then it started raining again, and they like they like stood up. They were singing, yeah. right? Yeah. Because the rain came, the dew yeah. came, and they were started to become saturated again. The ground started having nutrients again, photosynthesis, right? (laughs) I mean, we were made from the dust of the ground. You guys realize that? The sun. But God's the sun. He's the light. And so even photosynthesis declares our union with God and how it works. We're the dust of the ground. The sun comes and produces nutrients in us and brings forth fruit. I think that um, I think that's it. That's wonderful. It's such a gentle gospel. It's not that turn or burn. It's just <laughs> <laughs> that gentle, that rain and that gentle dew. I mean, I'm just yeah, mm, making me feel weepy. <laughs> yeah, and and so the gospel. You know what? You know what kept Jesus when he walked the earth? Union with the Father. And he had the Spirit all the time, which is the presence of the Father. He had the Spirit all the time reminding him of the presence and the union. Because he had a body that was in the likeness of sinful flesh, which means it could feel weakness, it could feel pressed in on. He could see the corruption around him. He could see the death around him. He could see the barrenness. And what kept him was this union with God. And so I preach all this so we can just be reminded the gospel is much more simple than we think. It's not about all these things we've got to figure out how to work and apply. It's really about us just being reminded of union, right? Because in that union, we start bearing much fruit, right? It's just the being stirred up by way of remembrance about what it means that we're one flesh with God through the body of the Lord Jesus. When we take communion now, I used to just take communion thinking I could be healed. I can be healed. There's nothing wrong with that if that's where you are. There's different stages of growth. But now when I take communion, I'm being reminded that I'm one flesh with God through the body of Jesus. 
and I'm being caught up in that union when I take communion. That's what I'm thinking of. When I take the cup and I'm thinking about the blood of the new covenant, I'm not thinking about a legal contract anymore. Although there was one point where I was thinking, we got a new arrangement. And there, listen, that was from where I come from, the glory to God. And that was good news, but it was a piece of it that could still be expounded. Now when I take the blood of the covenant, I'm thinking about this guy who was so serious about laying down his life, pouring himself out for me, he even shed his blood. That's what remembering me and uh, remembering my death. Yeah. Until I come. That's right. That's right. That's the blood of the new covenant. That's the ratification. When there was blood in the old covenant, the ratification... Now, the carnal mind couldn't perceive what the law was actually declaring. The law was a shadow of Jesus. It was, God was actually prophesying that He would carry their weight. He would make them exceedingly fruitful. He gave them the promised land. But they were looking to their own strength. You could read the whole book of Deuteronomy, and He tells them to wrap the law around their arm, that it would be frontlet between their eyes. Do you know what the law He had them wrap on their arms? It wasn't 600 13 commandments. It wasn't even thou shalt and thou shalt not. Do you know everything he had written on the little scroll that was written in there? Five things. And you know what they all were? About what he did to lead them out of Egypt. By strength of my hand, I led you out of Egypt. By the lamb I provided, death passed over you. I brought forth water out of the rock. I parted the Red Sea. I provided manna from heaven. I gave you a land that you didn't have to plant vineyards, that you didn't have to make buildings. All of that was meant to remind them every time they looked at their own hand and thought it was by their own strength they have this land, by their own goodness, they would be reminded that it was the goodness of God. But they were carnal, sold under sin. So they looked at the law and thought, we have to work these things. Right? And so even the blood of the old covenant, it was ratifying their union to God. That's what it was about. Covenant, union, marriage. We even have something in Louisiana called covenant marriage. Where if you want to make it harder to get divorced, you get a covenant marriage instead of just a normal marriage. And in that covenant marriage, because it's a covenant, you have to wait longer to get divorced. And you have to do required counseling before you can have the divorce. And so covenant, we, we can think of all these things. That's what's so beautiful about the manifold wisdom of God. We can say all these things that help people, but we never want to lose sight of the relationship that's oozing from it, the marriage language, the, the union, and what it's trying to declare to us. Right? I mean, the author of Hebrews goes on to say, I will write my law on their heart. You think he's talking about thou shalt and thou shalt nots? Do you know what he's talking about? I will write on their hearts that I provided myself the lamb. I will write on their hearts how I shed my own blood. Paul comes talking in Acts 20, I think verse 32, about how God shed his blood. Yeah. Go read it. And so the law he writes on his heart, on our hearts, is how he laid his own life down so we could be delivered from him who had the power of death so that we could be set free from our bondage. What bondage? We knew we we're supposed to be fruitful, but we're barren. So now we're laboring, trying to make ourselves fruitful. And so that's the law he writes on your heart. And you know that because the author of Hebrews comes and says, the result of the law that's written on our hearts is that we will see that he's our God and we will be his people. Yeah. To call somebody God means that they've taken the responsibility of you having life on themselves. That's the only way someone can be your God. They can't come and call you their God unless they're going to take upon themselves the weight of producing life in you. And that's the proposal. And he's showing you, I actually have a life that can do what I say. So, glory to God. What do you guys think?